Hi, everybody. It's Rob Shapiro from In the Mind Of. Today, we're going to take a look at what it takes to speak to a doctor. Um, with me is Ben Gelfan. Ben is physical therapist for 30 some odd years, and they've been odd years, right, Ben? And they've been very odd uh, at times. Ben, ben started out at Lenox Hill Hospital with um, Dr. Nicholas, and he, he uh, founded NISMA, or works with, is the director of NISMA out there, which was great, and then he was uh, at his own practice for 16 years. So Ben comes to us with a ton of experience and interesting side with Ben is Ben is more of the, um, has a lot more medical background. And I always think of myself as less, more of a, you know, grassroots PT guy and Ben has always been the medical side. So the two together, we've been a good combination. Welcome, Ben. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Professor. Good. Uh, what did I miss? Did I hit you? Give you a quick, yeah. uh, quick yeah, intro, quick but what did I miss? So, uh, yeah, I started, I've been at this for about 30 years. Um, I graduated in 1988. So, through the late 80s and early 90s, or through the 90s, I was uh, at Lenox Hill Hospital, then uh, managed to work my way up to director of the Nicholas Institute of Sports Medicine and Athletic Trauma, NISMAT. And there I dealt with really a lot of orthopedic uh, post surgical uh, patients. So, as, as you said, we, we were a research based and surgically based sports medicine facility. Um, had a lot of experience with uh, a lot of the professional teams in New York at the time. So I got a, a very large uh, variety of uh, from weekend warriors to professional athletes to people who just had to make it to work. So a lot of that. And then in 2000, I joined my, I, I formed my own practice with a partner, but I formed my own practice called Sports Therapy and Rehabilitation, Star Physical Therapy, um, to which I sold uh, after 15 years. And we went from Two, phys two physical therapists, uh, all the way to about 25 physical therapists in the course of those 15 years. And that is, comes down to really what this conversation is about. Our success has to do with the relationships we created, um, in particular for this talk, um, the relationships with the referral sources, and in our case, mostly physicians. Okay, awesome. There's, there's a, interesting, there's a lot of young therapists out there. And as you said, our talk is going to be about, you know, how do we, how did they get their name out there? How did they become trusted by the doctors? And one thing I've noticed with you over the years is you have, you know, Ben meets somebody and they ha he has their phone number, they have his phone number, um, he's always going back and forth. So what's the trick for young therapists? You know, for us, it's experience, time, being in the right place at the right time. But somebody coming out right now, they graduated in 2019, 2020, and they have to start uh, having relationships with doctors, other medical professionals. Where do you start? Where would you go? And I think with anything, you have to know where you are at this point of your career. Um, you have to start out at the appropriate level and you have to learn from your surroundings. Um, understanding that relationships do take confidence and um, th that confidence will come over time. Even if you're young, some people are, are better at creating those relationships than others. Others will have to learn this a little bit more. But a lot of it has to do with internal confidence, internal pride, and then not taking, taking what you do very seriously. We want you to be very serious professionals, but don't take yourself that seriously. And once you can have that confidence with not taking yourself too seriously, all relationships become a little bit more casual and they become a little less transactional because everybody gets invited into your house, so to speak. Whether you go as far as giving your cell phone number and your other contacts, that, that will be a stylistic thing, but for me, it is a breakdown of those barriers as best I can. Um, takes away the transactionalness, and physicians and other referral sources really take that, uh, and they really kind of thrive on that friendship plus professionalism. Okay, so you're gonna, in the next uh, 20 minutes, you're gonna be my mentor. I'm gonna ask you, hey Ben, I just saw this patient. I don't know Dr. So-and-so, what do I do? So what would you say to me? How, where would you start? Right. And what I would want from you right away is to know the physician's name, uh, the diagnosis of the patient, the age of the patient, and what, the, what uh, the gender of the patient is, and obviously the name. The reason I want to know that is because I need you to know that. I need you to know all of that information in order to go and speak to that physician. Okay, so that's number one. I think that that the younger generation, I shouldn't even say younger generation, not a generational thing, but the younger professional um, sort of goes from point A to point B without getting the basics. So if you know the basics, um, then you would go and try and reach out to that physician. 
in our age, before emails and texts, it was phone calls. Nobody in today's time, um, not even my mother, I don't think, wants to hear from me <laughs> by word of mouth. But certainly in the physician's office, a physician or their front office or you as a clinician don't want to be taken away from your patient. You're having this, this relationship with your, your patient under your care right now. They don't want to be interrupted by a phone call for a question from another clinician or with a problem from another clinician. So it's important to find those alternative ways of interacting with the, with the, the, the physician. Um, most of that is either with cell phone, with text messaging, with office manager um, or their contact or through email. That would now, be you the know, main thing. Uh, sorry, if you know the, know the doctors, what is like, there's two sides of it. If I was a doctor, I'd be like, oh, so-and-so is calling. Like, when are they going to say, you know, hey, Ben's calling open arms versus, oh, you know, therapist A is, B is calling me. Like, what well, do they want to hear? What don't they want to hear? Sure. And just with everything in healthcare and everything in medicine, there's always a risk reward, right? The, is it worth it? Um, are you going to either, you know, is it worth the, the physician's time and your time to report this? And so I think number one has to be um, you have to develop that trust within the physician and you have to develop your own reputation for not uh, calling frivolously, for not communicating frivolously um, with, uh, about patients or about anything. Um, so you start with, if you're going to communicate with them, you start with just giving them the headlines, right? So Joe Friday from Dragnet, that old, old show, it's just the facts, ma'am, and or sir. And so you want to give them those four things I wanted, the demographics of the patient, and then just the headlines. You don't want to go too deep because if, it's, if it needs to get deeper, they'll call you or you'll call them. But it's just the headlines. They will respond to that without any fear or favor. They will respond to that. And it's important that you are corresponding with them for in good times and in bad times. Okay. So to go back just a drop, however, um, you, um, in starting that communication, in learning how to do that communication, you have to develop a rapport through the patient that they are referring to you. So we talk about sort of point A to where you and I are 30 years later. But in the beginning, the way you're going to meet and greet the physician is the physician is going to hear about you through their patient. The physician is going to hear about you through hopefully positive results from your patient. Um, I think you and I, which we talk a lot, and, and uh, I should say I value your friendship over the time I've been here at Professional and, and have really enjoyed my time here. Um, a lot has to do with you. But uh, you and I speak a lot of, about this stuff. And um, we talk about um, when the patient goes to visit their physician. Have them mention our names a few times. Oh, yes, I'm seeing, you know, Dr. So-and-so or, you know, Ben Gelfin or Rob Shapiro or, you know, whoever. And, boy, they're doing a great job. Or it could be I'm seeing Ben Gelfin and boy, he really, he doesn't pay attention to me. He doesn't, uh, he's not around, he's not present. Uh, he doesn't really follow what I'm doing. And then their results are not so good. So you could, you could have two ways really of establishing that name, your name to physicians. I can tell you that physicians m remember more the bad results in the beginning than yeah. the good results. So it takes a few more good results in order to start to get your name to penetrate. So really take yourself, remember how I said, don't take yourself too seriously, but take what you do seriously. Take the patient seriously. It is you and them in the room. All right, so interesting story. So one of my, one of my therapists uh, a couple of years ago was always a very good therapist, had really good relationships with his patients, never met any doctors, interesting part, but, will be people who go back and they'll go back, uh, go back to the doctor and talk about so-and-so. And the doctor will tell us, you know, who's this guy, Jim? You know, I want to meet him. I, you know, I've heard, I send him patients all the time. I never met the guy, but his patients talk so highly of him. So that's a component too. So don't always think that there are certain personalities that will go in and say, love to call and email their docs. And, but be a, if you're not that therapist, which is fine, be that therapist who makes sure their patients 
have a great experience. They go back to the doctor, they rave about you. And the doctor will send even probably even not even have met you. If you get your patients to rave about you, I can't couldn't believe that this, this one therapist will have people ask specifically for him. The doctor saw him, this therapist outside didn't have no idea who he was. So the key, you know, the key is your patients are besides you calling, but I think your patients become a very good advocate of the therapist. And that's huge. You know, different they personalities, you, call- you know, whereas Sorry, What's that? I said, they, no, yes, the patient are your calling cards. You said, don't rather than calling, Absolutely. they are your calling cards. Um, yeah, how do you get, how does one get those number? Like, it sounds odd, but I'm a new therapist. and How do I get this doctor's number, his email? Like, who's going to give it to me? Where do I start? Right. So uh, at, here at, at Professional, we have a, a certain archive of our contacts to some degree. We're always looking at it as a new therapist and new clinician. You want to establish new rapport, new relationship with new docs. Um, the key there is understanding, again, that you want to create this relationship, this humanistic relationship. Obviously, the physician knows that you are there as a therapist to a certain degree, that you are there looking and wanting to see patients. That's what you do for a living. But if you can relay a certain message, and hopefully it's sincere, and with me it's very sincere, I know with you it's very sincere, that you'd like to get to know this physician in a personal way, not in any inappropriate way, but in a personal way beyond just the fact that they are the referral source, the spigot, if you will, the faucet for all of your patients. They want to, they, they feel better knowing that you won't care about them as an individual, care about the health of them and their practice, which is their baby, as well as your practice being your baby. Um, and having that relationship, having that agreement that it's not just about uh, the pipeline, not so transactional. Um, And then understanding, they will understand that, and very often they will understand that they have a business, they need their patients too. It's not like when you and I started out and um, really it was, we were technicians and we can only treat via referrals from physicians. Nowadays there's direct access, we are a referral source returning back to the physician. So some of that transaction is now a two-way street as well as hopefully deeper than that. And so they will very often say, you know what, for your patients, and this is what I would say in the reverse too, but for your patients, I'm going to give you my cell phone, whether it's my cell phone or, you know, the business's cell phone or whatever, or my personal email or the company's email, but I'm going to give you something that you, you give it to your patients, but it's the bat phone, if you will for anybody who remembers Batman, but it's the bat phone that you could get directly to me. And I promise you, I will take care of your patients and I will manage them because I want to represent you well, you being the physician. So the 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 interesting part, I asked one of the docs recently that I know, I said, how come Dr. Andrews, right? Jim Andrews out of Birmingham, which I know you know, Dr. Andrews is probably the, probably the most well-known orthopedist in the country. If not, you know, one of the top five. And I asked this other doc, like, how does, how does Dr. Andrews, why, how did they become that name? He goes, besides being a good, a lot of good orthopedists, but he said, took out his phone. He goes, if I called Jim right now, he'd answer the phone. So what you had said, that, that was the key part. And the same, I thought, I love the story, the Dr. Andrews story you give, if you don't mind, how he, sure. relationships he has with his patients. I think it's an awesome, you know, yes. often experience and often thing to see. Yes, and so, and again, it, Dr. Andrews is sincere enough, and then I'll go into that quick story, the, the story with the fellows, I presume you're talking about, right? Correct, um, yeah. But, mm-hmm. but, uh, but he also has the sincerity and the smarts to remember who you are and the context to which he met you. So it all comes back to the success, and they become gurus, or almost Bengali, but gurus, because they can see you. And they look at you, and I'm looking at you right now, just you, and it's just you, you and I are only in the room together anyway, but it's just you and me together. And that's what he does. So back to the story is that um, I I had the pleasure of being with him for a few weeks, Um, just opportunities come up, and I would suggest taking these opportunities to learn to anybody listening, and uh, went down to Birmingham, Alabama, and uh, I was one of about 15 to 20 people. Most of those guys were physicians. Um, research fellows, clinical fellows, but all fellows. And we were his entourage for the moment. And literally, I was the, uh, the rear end of the 15-man 
centipede, if you will. And Dr. Andrews goes in and we all come in and I'm the last one in because I'm the, the last one in. And I close the door and Dr. Andrews sits and just forgets about all, any of us being there. And it's just him and this patient. And he knows when he's got to investigate a little further or not. But this was a healthy post-operative ACL. Didn't even get undressed. He sat down, crossed his legs with his Alabama Southern drawl, and says, how y'all doing, ma'am? And they went back and forth for literally maybe a minute to two minutes. Now, he didn't have much to, to offer her, but just to make sure she felt taken care of, just to make sure there was no emergencies he had to check in. And then he gets up and leaves. And then I'm the 15th man, that 15th man out, and I'm saying, boy, wait, what just happened here? I don't understand what happened. Uh, I would what never test did he do? What big thing? <laughs> what? Right, what test did he do? He didn't do anything crazy, no big tests, nothing. No big tests, <laughs> nothing. Right, nothing. Like what? Nothing. And, and if somebody, you know, in my practice, just started my practice, and they would, they would never pay for this. And I'm about to go out, I'm about to shut the door, and this lady, very nice lady, goes, isn't he wonderful? And it was then, mm -hmm. right then and there, I realized that what it was, it's for that moment, it was undivided caring between a physician and a patient under normal circumstances. I can guarantee you if there was anything wrong, Dr. Andrews would turn into truly Dr. Andrews. But in this case, he was the caretaker. In this case, it was capitalizing on this relationship that he had. Now, we're going to talk another time about patient relationships, but it's that same sincerity, that same, I keep doing this because just tunnel vision focused towards that physician that is going to create and foster that relationship. I think we, we also talked about, and I think it's a very good point about, you know, realizing we are referral sources for the doctors too, and we are, you know, and if you have a good relationship, which, you know, you and I have over, over time, you can give your opinion, and if the doctor respects you, that's what you want it to be. Especially these days with doctorates and the vision, you know, the vision 2020 of us being the provider of choice. You know, finding more that we can guide people. And I find, you know, as I get older too, I don't know if it's a sign of age or just the way the PT world is done, but we're finding we're the ones. And you can kind of pick as a therapist, as long as you're not taking away from a different doctor that sent you somebody. But if somebody comes to you outside, you could also say and make sure. I would tell a doctor, hey. You know, tell them. You know, tell them I sent you, or I'll give them a heads up that you're coming. But I want, I wanted. I would tell a doctor I wanted the patient to see you, right? right. And they have that whole idea of, you know, oh, the next time they have a patient who doesn't have a therapist, they'll they'll right. send it. Or you want to be that therapist in my mind who, you know, I might have a relationship with facility X, but you know, Ben Gelfand when it comes to the hip, you know, if you're really going to have a problem, he's the guy to see. And that's where you want to do it as a, as a clinician, you know, have that relationship that the doctor can respect you as much as, you know, you respect them. Yeah. I think that's huge these days. Yeah. And you said a whole lot in that, that point in a whole lot of meatiness that I'd love to try and un, unwind a little bit to, to take point by point. And I agree with you a hundred percent. And number one, yes, vision 2020 or 2025, the doctors of PT. And I say doctors of PT with quotes, we are doctors, but don't, use that as to try to one up or try and and uh, be, I don't want to say be equals, but try and make yourself out to be the MD or the PhD. Um, so we are very fortunate and it's a powerful, powerful title, more with when talking with patients than it is with the physician. But the Vision 2020 has done wonders for us as a profession. It has given us uh, independence, it has given us autonomy, it has allowed us, for those of us who really take what we do seriously, not not us ourselves seriously, take what we do seriously, we want to be that success story. We want to have our following, we want to uh, have a name out there, stuff like that. Well, then that becomes a real referral source to physicians. So for the first time since you and I graduated in in 1892 or something like that. No, but the, mm -hmm. when, when you and I uh, graduated, um, there was no real way that we would be able to refer back. Now there is a real pot of patients that we could refer back to them. And there is nothing that says, I love you to a doc. And nothing that says, I have more confidence in you than sending a patient. So that's number one. Number two, you brought up 
um, you know, calling the doc. And I agree with you 100% somehow calling or texting or email communicating that you're sending over a patient. Now, it, it's very important not to sound like you are being tit for tat. Hey, look, I gave you that one patient. Now give me 20 more on your way. But right. more, like you said, you know, I think that you would be the best doc for this particular patient. This patient would do the best under your care. So you're, you're sending it to them, not for the transaction, but for the personal relationship, for the uh, professional uh, confidence you would have in them. So that's the other aspect of what you were saying. And then the last one I would say is, and, and a big common uh, thing I think that, that I know I used to when I was younger, and, and I think the younger guys do, is you see Dr. Jones and then you say, hey, Dr. Jones, you know Dr. Smith and Dr. Goldberg and, and Dr. whoever, and you start to mention these other docs, like you know, trying to become part of this gang, this inner circle of friends, right? The cool kids, if you will, on the block. Well, no physician really cares about the other doctors you know, because that means that you, that they are not the only girlfriend in the room, the only girlfriend at the dance, I think we say, or boyfriend right. at the dance for that fact. And so it's very important that you stay singularly focused on the physician you are talking to and the line of relationship that you have with that physician at that time. You have to be Switzerland. You have to be neutral. And then the other part is you have to also be able to communicate with them in good times and in bad times. And with the title of doctor, you have to be able to own some of the mistakes, some of the poor results that come. And there are some poor results that come from rehab issues. There are some poor results that come from uh, patient issues and some come from physician issues. We have to be able to own really a lot of the patient and the rehab issues and with that we have to be able to present that to the the physician as a colleague they don't want to have surprises or headaches um, when they are visiting with that patient at the time of their follow-up visit right one of the things you had mentioned at one point and you know uh, pretty important to you is uh, words you use you know you don't say you know you use the correct vernacular right you don't say um, you have a rotary cuff problem you know i mean you start to talk to the doctors in language you know, we try to do as PTs, we try to use you know, more impairments. And, but the problem is they really don't understand it. If we say you have a, disco, you know, a, a problem with your low back and it's, uh, you know, centralized, I don't think they understand the words. I think we have to learn, you know, language they use. So it's kind of interesting talking to a doctor. I think that that is so, so important. Uh, I, I used to tell, I learned the rotated cuff muscles as the sits muscles, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. And I remember uh, when Very I was good. young, nice back work. in 1988, <laughs> I would talk to the orthopedic, oh, they hurt their sits muscle. They hurt their butt? What, what? You know, what did they do? And so oh. words matter. And yes, we have our own vocabulary. And, and I've learned a lot of that vernacular from you, which has been really great. And this was, you know, I've known you from my 27th year to my 30th. 30th year or 32nd year, something like that. And um, that being said, um, and, and I've learned a lot and it's helped me in my practice and it's helped me communicate with other physical therapists. However, within the realm of the physician and whether we like it or not, it is the physicians follow the rules and the, the uh, validated and normalized vernacular, if you will, that is the mainstream. So not that we're so out there on, an, on the edge, but our words are not relatable to everyday objective international words of medicine. So I do think it's important that we, when we talk, we talk the talk and, and when we know um, the audience that we have. And if I may want to, I, I, I've written a book uh, many years ago now, a long time ago. And I remember I wrote it with a, a journalist who was on TV and it, the name doesn't matter. And I remember, well, how do you answer the questions? And he said, the two points, number one, always know your audience. And then the other one is answer the question you want to answer. So if you don't have the right mm -hmm. answer, then come up with something related. But he, the main one is always know your audience. And that's what came in very much throughout my career is knowing who and what I have to speak to and how I have to speak to them. Sounds good. Anything else? We'll kind of start finishing up, start finishing up, uh, kind of ending. And uh, anything else, any last parting uh, words of wisdom for Uncle Ben? Yeah, so uh, again, and you know, the, you, you guys, um, the younger generation, you and I have gone back and gotten our doctoral degrees and we 
um, wanted to stay relevant and understand the um, the power of that title and the the um, accomplishment that comes with that. Um, and I think it's very important that that we have the younger guys have that confidence when trying to create the relationship, but not overly confident to weaponize that. So I would not go to Dr. Andrews and say, hi, uh, I'm Dr. Gelfand. He, although we, we will treat each other coll collegially, he is the doctor, uh, I am Ben Gelfand, as I would do with others too, as, as other physicians would do to him. Knowing your audience is when you would use those titles. With patients, I think it's very important that you can introduce yourself as doctor and then our culture at professional and our culture as PT is really first name basis. So I wouldn't do that either, yeah. but I would have the confidence of that doctor. And then the other part would be that be sincere, be sincere, understand that yes, you have a goal of getting patients, but if you truly are sincere and, and self-aware enough to want to get to know this person who you are going to be dealing with, hopefully, you should be sincere about that and have some sincere back and forth outside of just the patients that you may benefit from that. And then of course, no headaches and they are the only person at the dance. And that would be my closing Great. statement to you. Great points. Great points. Something to think about. It's funny, even after 30 years, it's still, you know, little points everybody we bring up and say, that makes sense. I should do that or I should modify this. Great points. Just want to thank you. Thank you, Ben Gelfand. This is uh, Rob Shapiro from In the Mind Of. And we'll talk to you soon. Thank you.